host for the program, Coming Home. We began by meeting at uh, a hotel in the ballroom, and from there we, we uh, came upon a property that we are currently at today. And, and, and I get on them all the time. We have to change our thinking if we're ever going to walk in the kingdom of God. Well, hello and welcome to our Coming Home program. Uh, you may recognize the person sitting next to me as Pastor Jim Reinhart from Edgewood Bible Church in Edgewood, Iowa. Pastor Jim, I've been after you for about four months to get you back in here because he's been on the program before. Maybe you've seen him, but uh, the, the, this has a special meaning to me because Edgewood, Iowa is where I, I went to school and graduated there from high school. So um, there was a time when I probably knew a lot of people in the Edgewood area. Mm -hmm. And there's probably some that go to your church even that I yeah. went to school with. I know Gary Klosterman yeah. is one. Gary could tell you some stories about him and me when, oh, I'll have to check when in. we worked at Wilson's Meat Plant <laughs> <laughs> in our younger days. Yeah. But anyway, welcome to the program, Pastor Jim. Mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Jim and his wife Susan have been there at a little over five years in Edgewood. And um, I think he'll maybe have the opportunity to tell you himself that his wife, Susan, is a vital part of the ministry that goes on at that church. So um, with that, just share a little bit about yourself that for the benefit of those that maybe have not seen you on a previous broadcast. Okay. Um, I began pursuing my ministry career, oh, if I do the math, I think it was 38 years ago. Oh, my. At the age of 19, I uh, grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. I was very involved with the Youth for Christ ministry there. Decided to go into the pastorate, uh, went away to seminary at Dallas, Dallas Theological Seminary. Mm -hmm. I um, crammed a four-year program into seven years <laughs> <laughs> because I had to work my way through it. I, see. Okay. Uh, I finally completed that program, uh, went to uh, Denver, Colorado to get a second seminary degree there with an emphasis in counseling. Then uh, it was Colorado. So why leave? Yes. It, and I lived, right. I lived there for 20 years. Um, and primarily ministry-wise, I was involved with a, a school uh, at that time was situated there by the name of Rocky Mountain Bible College. I was a professor of mm -hmm. Old Testament there for 11 years. Um, then I decided to go back into the pastorate. I, I felt like the Lord wanted me to get back more involved with people and mm -hmm. ministry in that way. Basically did a nationwide search for a pastorate, uh, discussed it with my wife beforehand, shared with Susan, we can't stay in Colorado probably and get, get a pastorate here. Um, the competition's just too strict. And she said, well, Jim, I'll move anywhere in the country except for Iowa. I, I forgot that. So, <laughs> so the Lord says, okay, it's to Iowa. So now we now live in uh, here in Northeast Iowa, and we've been here a little over five years. Moved from uh, Mega City at Denver, Colorado, to wow. Edgewood, population about a thousand. Yes. So, uh, you know, the family is very well adopted, uh, adapted to it. Um, Susan likes the slower pace. Mm -hmm. um, I have a teenage daughter who, believe it or not, likes it better. She, she grew up in very close uh, proximity to Columbine High School. Oh and so there was all that tension and history all the time. Sure. And she was glad to get to a smaller town and away from that kind of thing. Uh, so, yeah, five and a half years, pastor at uh, Vegwood Bible Church. Um, have a lot of great people that attend there. Um, have had a lot of people uh, come to the church and stay with the church since we've come. Mm -hmm. You know, you always have that sort of honeymoon period where everybody's just checking you out. Sure. And we're past that now. Yep. So people are getting to know who we are and we're becoming more and more established in the community there. That's awesome. You know, you're a, a, you're a city on a hill. You're a bright light. Yeah. And I, it's amazing where I see God doing that with churches that start out small. And for whatever reason, yeah. it's got to be the heart of the people and their love for God yeah. and, their, and their love for people, you know, it's easier to love God than it is to love people, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Because He's perfect <laughs> yeah. and, and we're not. And we're not. And if somebody thinks they're perfect, then that's really evidence that they're not. Yeah. <laughs> now, there's a pastor friend of mine in Cedar Rapids, and he's got a big sign outside of his church that says, No perfect people allowed. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's one thing, too, I think that's been a personality change to our church. 
since we came, and maybe we brought a little bit of the Colorado culture with us, uh, you know, through, through my personality and my ministry, it's interesting. Um, we've gone from every man thinking that he had to wear a coat and tie every Sunday, mm -hmm. w women similar to us, to now every other Sunday I literally wear blue jeans yes. uh, on stage. And so uh, people are a little bit more relaxed and comfortable, yep. I hope, I think. Um, we have central air on a day like today that's huge <laughs> yes. you know so <laughs> yeah now you're talking about in the new facility or in the in the new facility in as the well new facility mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you are having services in the we're still meeting in the sanctuary okay that's our, our new facility right now is primarily a half-size gymnasium mm -hmm. but it was designed uh, aesthetically that we could do other things there just last saturday we had a very large uh, um, baby shower that was held in there mm -hmm. uh, this Saturday there's going to be some kind of a surprise party for a groom I don't know how that works it's different I'm used to different types of bachelor party parties for a groom. yes okay. yeah so that well maybe it won't be a surprise this won't air for a while though right yes. so it'll still be a surprise <laughs> and so yeah with our new family life center we're hoping to make it available to the community for as many possible sources as fits our guidelines, uh, you know, our, our allowances there. Uh, obviously, being a conservative Bible church, we still won't allow alcohol, that type of thing, but we want the community to realize that it's available for them as well. Praise God. Yeah. Yep. Like I said, I grew up in Edgewood. I remember, um, I could, in fact, I can tell you that the, the pastor that pastored that church when I was in high school there, or middle school and high school, was our bus driver also. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Uh, Hansen, and I believe, was that his name? Was uh, it Hansen or Hansel? Hansel. Hansel, Hansel. Mm -hmm. His son now attends our church. He's moved back from California. Mm. And uh, I drive a school bus. Mm -hmm. um, our Awana commander, Art Byers, drives a school bus. Mm -hmm. The Edgewood and Elkater transportation supervisor for the school. He's one of our deacons at our church. So we get involved with the community that way as yes. well. So you have, you have Sunday morning services, obviously. Yeah, every Sunday morning at 9.30, we have our Sunday school and adult Bible studies. We okay. have a couple of those for the adults and then age appropriate for the kids up through high school. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, anybody can come, we'll plug you in somewhere. And uh, then the worship service is at 10.30 okay. um, every Sunday. We then have an evening service at seven o'clock. Uh, on Sundays as well. You're still doing Sunday night services. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. There's not very many churches. I doing know that. it's a rare thing, um, and uh, it's something. Therefore, I try to make quite a bit different than uh, you know a traditional Sunday morning worship service, right. obviously, so that the people can get a taste of a little something different. A lot of times, it's more participation oriented than say mm -hmm. a sermon or something like that. That's awesome. And I'd ask you earlier, Pastor Jim, about your vacation Bible school you you had that last month in June I believe yeah yeah we typically have that in June um, we had the usual good attendance uh, I think the average was around 40 kids mm -hmm. which you know in a small church like ours it only averages lately I think we're averaging about 66 folks on a Sunday so 40 is yep. a good number yep. interestingly though since our congregation keeps getting younger and younger in the past very few of our vacation Bible school students attended our church right. Uh, this year it was almost half wow. that did. So that's an interesting dynamic that's changing that um, we're becoming younger uh, overall as a mm -hmm. congregation, just with time. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, for people that are viewing this, and that's people all over Northeast Ohio, there's some mm -hmm. people that might say, where is Edgewood, Iowa? Yeah, it's interesting because um, we'll uh, have people as far away as Iowa City, here in Dubuque, mm -hmm. Waterloo, they might ask that question. And it's interesting, um, in June, the last weekend of every June, we're actually on the national rodeo circuit. Oh, that's right. And so we say, well, we're with the rodeos. Oh, yeah, I've been there before. So yeah. we are uh, 12 miles straight north of Manchester, Iowa, mm -hmm. which is right on Highway 20. Mm -hmm. um, you get on Highway 13, go up, you'll see a great big sign that says Edgewood to the east. Yes. And there we are. That's absolutely awesome. Mm -hmm. So now you have so you have Sunday morning. You have uh, Sunday school at nine thirty. You have worship service at ten thirty. You have 
Sunday nights at seven, seven. Mm -hmm. and then you do you have midweek also? Well, we do not because Awana, when we have it on Wednesday That's nights, right. uses That's right. every square inch of our facility yep. as we spread out for the different age groups and the different yes. phases of that ministry. Um, we do have uh, my wife currently host a, a woman's Bible study in her home, mm -hmm. uh, very small home, so that's a little bit more <laughs> by reservation. Uh, but we have things that go on every now and then. And as the Family Life Center uh, nears its completion and construction, we plan on having some more regular uh, ministries there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're not even sure what all we're going to do there yet, probably depending on what volunteers come forward yes. to coordinate those different ministries that we'll have yes. during the week. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. You know, I, I uh, sometimes I just kind of go with whatever comes up in my mm -hmm. spirit or comes out of uh -huh. my mouth. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff happening in the world today, in the right. country today. Right, right. And uh, how do you find that affecting what messages you are teaching or preaching to your congregation? Well, you know, um, I've never been one, good or bad, I'm not saying one way or the other, I've never been one to to speak topically on something that pops up in the news. But as I'm preaching through a book of the Bible, we always go, usually go through books of the Bible expositionally. Mm -hmm. It comes out in the application. Sure. You know, obviously if we're talking about sin, if we're talking about evil, if we're talking about the moral decline I feel that we're going through in this country, then that would come in, you know, I might have a principle in scripture yes. where we can go back easily 2,000 years and we could see where those politics were affecting the way those folks were cheating or are treating Jesus Christ. Oh, wow. He taught something that made them feel uncomfortable. So, you know, what happened? That, you know, it led right up to his crucifixion. And so as we become known as a conservative Bible church, um, people are actually amazed. My wife has conversations through our Facebook account mm -hmm. for our church sometimes with folks that will actually ask, do you honestly still teach that all of the Bible is true and that it's not, <laughs> it's not uh, basically being um, diluted by modern day culture and that we should just accept that. And, and she'll say, well, you know, um, the way we apply it changes over time, but it never changes. It's the same God with the same uh, ideals of what is correct moral behavior and what is not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, funny you mentioned that, uh, this would have been maybe a year ago, one of the churches that's very close to us. We called our sister church because we ordained the pastor, Greeley Community Church. You oh. may know Pete Bushman. I've heard of him, yes. Um, uh, he actually invited Rafael Cruz to come and speak at his yes. church. And Rafael came and I went and I met with him and um, I sort of challenged him. I wanted to see where he stood on this. I said, you know, Rafael, I said, is it possible that the Lord would allow us to have governmental leaders that would actually allow the church or uh, the country to suffer because we as a church are sort of falling down Ooh. as far as being a good moral example or, 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 or winning that conflict. And he didn't like that at all, <laughs> you know, because of course, you know, <laughs> no, we still voter conscious. I said, I realize that we need to do that and we need to find um, good, moral, upright leaders for our local government and yep. our country even. And so the church needs to continue to be a beacon of light no matter what goes on in this country, mm -hmm. um, whatever the politics are. I, I very seldom have ever mentioned anything politically from the pulpit. Some people can draw their conclusions. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I feel very strongly about it, but I don't want anybody to come in to our congregation that has a certain political stance that would right. take offense right. at me being on the other side of the fence than them when all yes. I'm wanting to do is share the deeper truths of God's Word Yes, and, and an application for that, which can, can apply to anybody. I don't care sure. who you are. You, know. you don't have to fit the mold first. Right. I think we just present the truth and let it fall wherever it may, you know, and some people may not, but it's still the truth. Yeah, and that's, and, and, and it's interesting you ask that question because that has a little bit to do with the message that I'm going to share after, okay. which is basically, the title of my message is uh, Self-Deluded Sins of Pride. <laughs> In other words, how many 
very good Christian folk tend to judge others based on man-made standards rather than scriptural standards. Mm -hmm. And I think we even see some of that going on in the political arguments. Mm -hmm. And, and the, what I feel is a false view of who a Christian really is or what they should be. Yes. And, uh, and how we're often, we are judged for judging others, yeah. which is fine if we're not doing it correctly. If the right spirit. Yeah. You know, speaking the truth, I mean, again, let the words fall where they may. The truth is truth. I tell people, look, God, I can't help it. God is still holy. He hasn't yes. changed. He yes. is still yeah. holy, and I'm not. Right. And that hasn't changed, and it never will change. And without Christ, I don't have a hope. Absolutely. And, uh, so we're all sinners. We just have different issues. Yeah, different issues. There yeah. you go. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting you brought up the thing about judgment because we know that we have an adversary and one of his attempts to create chaos in, in any church is um, to get people to be offended with one another. Right. Over little things. You and, that, know? and that's exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, the Bible says that we are to speak the truth, but do it in love. And that's how people grow up, is by mm -hmm. hearing the truth spoken in love. And, you know, I, I just, I, I have people come to me and they say, well, do you know, what do you think God thinks of this? Not often, but what do you think God thinks about this? And I says, do you want me to be honest with you? Yeah, yeah. And, they, and most of the time they will say yes. Right. And I tell them what the scriptures say, and I simply say, God loves you. Mm -hmm. Do understand that he absolutely loves you, but he has not changed his standards right. for righteousness. Right. And, and not that we make it to heaven on our own good, right, good deeds or right. righteousness, but he still asks us and expects us to walk uprightly before him. Yes. It's just uh, what I see, and I think this comes out a lot so much in the media where the church uh, is um, criticized for not accepting a lot of the, the recent changes, in, especially here in America in our mm -hmm. culture. <clears throat> and, uh, and I think then a lot of Christians um, make the mistake of applying their own standards of righteousness that are not in Scripture so that the ones that are in Scripture are rejected. They, they throw the, you know, people will throw the whole baby out with right. the bathwater, right. so to I speak. Understand. You know, and, and on the other hand, we should not bend from what Scripture really does mm -hmm. say. If it's, if it's there and it's clear, it's a commandment by God, it's one of His expectations on us morally, we shouldn't water that down just to, so to speak, get more people to come through the doors of our church. Amen. So I'd ask you a question a few minutes ago, Pastor Jim, about uh, how that affected the, the, the events going on affects your messages that you mm -hmm. give. And, and I heard you say this, and this is important if you are a, a learner and have a desire to learn and understand the Bible. Now, you were a, you were a seminary professor for how many years? Eleven. So you've got the teaching gift, yeah. obviously. But I heard you say that you teach on your Sunday morning messages or whenever, that you're, you are going through books of the Bible right. and expounding on them and, right. and bringing out the full understanding of what that scripture says and is saying to us today, correct? That, well, that's very true. Um, and, and this is just a basic principle of Bible study that anybody should follow. But what I was taught at my seminary is in order to really understand what scripture is saying, you have to be a student of history as well. You have to find mm. out first what it meant to the very first audience that yes. heard that. And some people would say, well, since we're 2,000 years departed from that time, it really doesn't mean anything close to the same, but it does. <laughs> and it's, it's amazing how sometimes you don't even have to worry about the change in culture because there's just literally through our human natures mm -hmm. still being the same. We're still all descended from, from Adam and Eve. We still all have that same sin nature. We still mm -hmm. all have those same personality quirks. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes you really don't even have to change it at all just to apply it right up to today's time. Um, people uh, 2,000 years ago were still infatuated uh, with the idol of money. Mm -hmm. don't, can't we all relate yes, to that? Yes, today. Uh, with uh, pleasures of the flesh, with sexual pleasures. Mm -hmm. Turn on the television. Oh my. Of course, they didn't have TVs back then, but it's still it's a real small step mm -hmm. to say it's the same standards. Uh, are found in God's word. They do not change. 
And there's also a lot of, of good news for hope in people's lives because Jesus constantly reached out to the folks who were even rejected by their societies mm -hmm. because they appeared to have something wrong with them. Yep. And uh, Jesus looks at the heart. He looks at all of our hearts. And uh, you just have to go a little bit deeper with some people than others. But yes. you'll find that we're all sinners, but we need Jesus Christ because He provides that hope mm -hmm. uh, for life through Him and through change and uh, through better relationships with one another and especially with the Lord. Yes. I had an opportunity just this past, what is today, Thursday? Mm -hmm. So Tuesday night. Tuesday night to speak to a group of high school mm -hmm. kids at a youth camp. Okay. And um, I had asked the Lord, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, um, what I heard the Lord say to me in my heart was, tell them who the ones are that, that the Lord chooses. And so I opened that up and I went to 1 Corinthians where he talks about that, that God, I said, if you're a sinner, if you struggle with... If you have problems, you have temper problems, you have rebellion pro issues, you got, you, you're just the one the Lord is looking for. <laughs> right. Not the per He's not looking for the perfect child. He's not looking for the perfect teenager. He is uh -huh. looking for the one that's struggling with sin. Because right. in that person, the person that has problems, God is able to demonstrate His power to change their life. Mm -hmm. And when I got saved, and if there was, there's people in Edgewood, if you go, go back and you run into some people <laughs> that knew me or that were around when I went to high school, they may remember me. But I t and that for things that I wish they wouldn't remember me for. <laughs> but um, you know, I was, I, I just say I was, I was a person without God. Mm -hmm. And like you said, that sin nature that's in us is, uh, it, it just happens. It's like weeds growing in a garden. Right. You don't have to do anything. They just grow. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you know, if you think about it, too, the people who think that they're the most righteous are less likely to even listen to the word with the consideration that anything needs to change in their life. But mm -hmm. Probably every preacher knows this, every pastor of a church. When he gives a sermon on Sundays, about half the people are really thinking about what they're going to do later that day. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe if you're lucky, a quarter of the people are really focused in on what you're teaching them from God's Word. Yes. And another quarter of people are thinking, this sounds pretty good, and they're thinking of somebody else that needs to hear it. <laughs> you know, without stopping to think, I need to hear this. You know, th th there's this illusion that I have arrived uh, to the point to where it's just, you know, not that I'm perfect. They, they would never verbalize that, but they're sort of saying, that in some ways they are because they think that they've reached a point where they no longer need to grow spiritually. Um, it's interesting, we have one gentleman who teaches our older adult Bible study on Sunday mornings, uh, Alfred Anthes, and uh, so he's been teaching scriptures now for 50 years, and he says, the more I learn from the Bible, the more sinful I become. Yes. His lifestyle hasn't changed, but his own mind, he realizes more and more yes. that it's more based on how we treat one another yeah. than some checklist of do's and don'ts and, um, and how to love people despite their, yeah. their imperfections, just like Jesus does, and to, uh, to love them. And, and, and then my job as the pastor, obviously, one of my jobs is just to teach God's Word and let the Holy Spirit do the work. Yes. Uh, share a little bit about some of the people in your church. I, mm -hmm. uh, I know that you have worship. You have a, obviously have a worship leader. I know mm -hmm. your wife does a lot of the things too for your Sunday services. And um, just uh, who, do you, who do you have in your church that's doing what? Because I know you, you yeah. can't do it all. No pastor no. can do it all. Well, you know, and sad to say my personality is to try. <laughs> that's just the way I'm wired, but it's wrong. Yes. You know, you should delegate everything. And I do try to encourage people to get involved with the ministry in many different ways. Uh, a few months ago, I changed something that had been gone, going in the church for decades, probably, where every morning worship service, the pastor, or one of the, the people that normally led worship would read just a call to worship. And I said, let's change that and have a different man uh, in the church every Sunday mm -hmm. reading the scripture for the morning yes. and 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 we've got ladies up there helping us with the worship now miranda buyer who's got a dance studio there in edgewood um she uh is 
she helps me. Mm -hmm. she, she leads the worship on Sunday mornings now, and then every other Sunday we have a worship team mm -hmm. with some other folks that help uh, to sing and, and to get more people excited about worshiping God mm -hmm. and learning what it really means to worship God. And Miranda is much younger than me, which isn't saying a lot to get there, but uh, so she understands better how to lead people uh, to learn some of the more contemporary songs. Yes. And so we're starting to blend some of those in with our worship so that the young people don't feel left out. My wife, Susan, I guess she would call like our technical director. Um, she's almost 100% responsible. Well, I guess I could say she's 100% responsible for our, um, putting together a slideshow that we show throughout the worship service every Sunday. Uh, she maintains our website. She maintains our Facebook account. I've got a couple of other very capable and willing volunteers that actually run the slideshow for mm -hmm. us on Sunday mornings. So, uh, like I already shared, uh, Art Beyer uh, is our Awana commander. That's I a see. very key ministry yes. that we have to children there, evangelist ministry. Jim and Sandy Tucker, yep. uh, they kind of like do it uh, so much for the church. They, you know, they do all the publications of our newsletter, our bulletins. Supervisor Sunday School, highly involved there. Um, and then there's folks that have been doing it for years and years. Like I said, I probably don't have time to name them all. At one point, the average age, no, uh, of all of our uh, helpers with Awana, the teachers and directors, uh, the average time of service spent with Awana was 18 years. So we're talking a long time uh, oh, commitments my. to that ministry. And uh, we're like any church probably. You've got about a quarter of the people that do 90% of the work. Yeah. You know, I call them the disciples. You know, and the rest of the people, they, they do work for the ministry in other ways, in their communities sure. and that type of thing in serving God. But uh, it really is a family project. Mm -hmm. And whenever we have a visitor coming to our church, that's really what they're doing is, is they're meeting the family yep. of, of uh, Edgewood Bible Church. I like that because a church is a family. And you yeah. know, that's how we came up with the name Coming Home for this mm, program. Yeah. Because yeah, exactly. when, uh, you know, two, two things. One is that when a person comes to Christ for the very first time, it's like he's just come home. He's like the prodigal son that's been out right. there, experienced uh, how, what all the world could do to rip him down and turn him <laughs> apart. And he, and he comes <coughs> back to the father's house which is the church uh, coming back to the Lord. And, and it's like coming home to the Father, to the mm. Heavenly Father. And mm -hmm. the same is true when you find a church home. And you know, I've, I've heard that there's as many as 40 million people in America who say they are Christians, but do not attend a church. Right, right. I know the statistics are amazing. And some of you watching this, maybe you don't, maybe you watch Christian television and don't attend a church. And I just would like to say this to you, that I've known, I've known Pastor Jim for uh, four or five years now. He was my mother's pastor until she went to be with the Lord here last August. But th this is a family church. And when you find a church, when you walk in the door and before that service is over and you leave, you feel like this is it. This is it. I found my home. I found right. my church family. Right. Uh, and I believe if you are looking for a church and you live within 25 miles of, of Edgewood, take a drive up there sometime and visit mm -hmm. uh, the Edgewood Bible Church and see what you sense and feel coming from the people, not just the pastor, but the love that's in that church and, and the teaching that you heard Pastor Jim talk about that he's doing. And by the way, if you have, maybe you live out of state, but you have someone that lives near Edgewood, tell them about Edgewood Bible Church. Absolutely. And so with that, Pastor Jim, any last comments before we go into your preaching time? You know, just that if, uh, if you're ever curious about what goes on at my church, uh, best time to find out is actually to come on a worship service on mm -hmm. Sunday mornings at 1030. Our opening slide on our announcements every morning is an empty chair. It says a place for you. Wow. And we will find that if you come to my church. That's awesome. Yeah. And you do have a Facebook page. We have Facebook. Um, go to Edgewood Bible Church. I don't know how Facebook works, but Edgewood Bible Church Online dot org is our website. Okay. And I think that would get you to our Facebook as well. If you put Edgewood Bible Church on Facebook in Iowa, there's also one up in the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. So make sure you put down uh, Edgewood Bible Church in Iowa. Yep. 
Well, Pastor Jim, it's been good to have you on the program. And do stay tuned for the second half of this program. Because if you would like to know more about the Word of God and understand what the Bible is saying to you personally, Pastor Jim is going to help you do that in the next 30 minutes. God bless you. Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Reinhart, and I am pastor of Edgewood Bible Church in Edgewood, Iowa. Our church is located about 12 miles north of Manchester. Go up Highway 13 and turn east on Highway 3, and you'll find our church right there near the center of town. Today, uh, I would like to share with you something from God's Word, and if you have a Bible there at home or, or whatever type of device you might use to look at scriptures, I would encourage you to follow along with me, and we will be in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 14. Specifically, we're going to try and get through the first 14 verses there this evening, Luke in chapter 14. I recently read about a young woman who asked for an appointment with her pastor to talk with him about a besetting sin for which she was worried. When she saw him, she said, Pastor, I have become aware of a sin in my life which I cannot control. Every time I am at church, I begin to look around at the other women, and I realize that I am the prettiest one in the whole congregation. None of the others can compare with my beauty. What can I do about this sin? The pastor replied, Ma'am, that's not a sin. Why, that's just a mistake. And so we see how often we make ourselves out to be more than we really are. And what we do then is we become fools simply because we think that we're better than others when we really are not. Now, there's some places in Scripture where we see that it is okay to be a fool at times, especially if we're a fool for Christ, like the Apostle Paul said. But oftentimes, usually, especially for believers in Jesus Christ, those who uh, publicize that they are Christians. We mess it up, if you will, because of our pride, because of our judgmentalism, because we think that we're better than everyone else in every way. And they can sense that. And quite frankly, it turns them off. I don't think that all pride is sinful. I think that sometimes it's good to have pride in a job well done. I'm not talking about that type of pride. I'm talking about the type of pride where a person is, how can we say, arrogant, judgmental, selfish, use other people to get ahead in the world. And they do it in a manner that makes them look like, quite frankly, they think that they're better than anyone else, like I've already said. But pride, even for the most devout Christian, can actually become an undetected disease that separates us from God when it motivates us to elevate ourselves above others for the mere sake of improving our own self-image. Pride in and of itself among what I call do giddy Christians often becomes the most unchristlike behavior that anybody can exhibit. And you may not agree with me, but I think that as we get to this text here today, that is actually what Jesus is talking about. What we're going to see in this text this morning is that Jesus is being set up by some most prideful religious people that you will ever meet. It's uh, Before I read the text here, at least part of it, so you know what's going on, Jesus has gone to uh, a Sabbath service there at a synagogue. He was probably invited to be the keynote speaker, as was often the case when he traveled from town to town. He was a well-known, popular rabbi in the area. And then after that service, uh, we'll see in the text, he was invited to dinner. And I think you'll see it as I read it. They were actually laying a trap for him as he was invited in to share in that meal. He sniffs it out, and then he shares a parable to those men. 
in women in response. Here in Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, follow along with me. I'm using the older NIV version. Any version you have will do. It says, One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent, remember that word, Pharisee, he was being very carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisee and experts in the law, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him away. Now here's the parable. Then he asked them, If one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on a Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to the better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of your fellow guests, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. These guys had laid a trap for Jesus Christ, and it pointed out some of their own characteristics some major flaws in their own ideas of who was holier than another person and how to get there. These flaws, I fear, are evident in the lives even today of many Christians who, in order to really serve God, think that they must impose their own self-righteous will on others, whether it is based on God's Word or not. So many of us, Maybe all of us, to a certain degree, suffer from what I call a self-deluded, sinful pride. And what I mean by self-deluded is that one or many of our sins in our life might not be recognized by us as sins. In other words, we just think we call it aspects of our personality, if you will. But oftentimes it's something that we do in order to make ourselves look better than others. And that might be the only reason we do it. And I see this even in the church, even amongst Christians. It might float out there on the surface for others to see, but it's deeply embedded in our thoughts so we don't even recognize it. And so I'm going to give you three principles here today that will help you as a believer in Jesus Christ to overcome what I call the self-deluded sins of pride. And the first one is this. By ignoring our own sinfulness, we often do that when it comes to judgmentalism. Principle number one, we often ignore our own sinfulness when it comes to judgmentalism. Mentalism. And by judgmentalism, what I mean is this, wrongly judging someone else. Now, sometimes we can rightly divide God's Word. We can distinguish what sinful behavior is or is not. And we can point that out in the life of another person for their benefit. We should do that lovingly. We should do that privately. We should do that quietly. We should do it with words and not body language. We should do it lovingly. That's not the kind of judgmentalism I'm talking about. Here's a definition of judgmentalism that I'm using here in this context today. Judgmentalism is then the act of condemning another without due cause to make oneself look better than them. In other words, it's self-serving. It's a judgmentalism with a, a motive of making oneself look better than them. These would be things a lot of times that we judge people on based on what we've learned in our homes growing up or what we think we've learned rightly from God's Word, but we took it in the wrong way. Sometimes they're self-serving. Sometimes we want to be able to make ourselves look spiritually superior to others because we can sing better than them, because we can 
teach better than them, because we can memorize Scripture better than them. All good things that serve the Lord, but if we think that we are better than someone else in God's eyes because we are more gifted in these ways, we are actually, believe it or not, being judgmental if we display or publicize that we're better than them because of those gifts. It's, it's a malicious agenda of making ourselves look better than others. And this is how it works out in the context historically of our message as we look at it here today. Jesus Christ was invited to a meal, and as he got into the meal, he realized that only distinguished what we down south call highfalutin people were invited to attend. And I think that most of the guests at that meal were all of like mind and were seeking an opportunity, I believe a trap was being laid, seeking an opportunity to make Jesus look bad. Now, of course, if anybody ever taught Scripture, it was Jesus. God Himself inspired every single word in the Scriptures. There's no error here. That's what Jesus taught. <laughs> the Apostle John tells us that Jesus is the Word of God. But they disagreed with some of what he was saying, and they had a different idea of what righteousness was. They had added to God's Word. They had misconstrued it. They had made up their own list of rules, and Jesus up and broke one of those. They set him up so that he would do that. They, they put this crippled man in front of him because they knew that he wouldn't be able to resist, as he had done so many times in the past, resist healing that man. And they were ready for him to heal that man. They had no compassion for that man. They put him there. They planted him there. They put him in a meal where he would not normally have been accepted because his malady even affected his physical appearance, we'll see. And so Jesus was there. He had compassion on the man. He healed the man. And here's the big supposed sin that he committed according to those self-righteous Pharisees. He did it on the Sabbath. And they had added so many rules to what it meant to keep the Sabbath that you can divide them up into 39 different categories. One of those was you were not allowed to heal a sick person, an injured person, to do anything to help them heal medicinally on the Sabbath, except for to save their life. You, In other words, in modern lingo, you could stabilize the patient, but wait until sundown before you really took care of the problem. And so here, Jesus heals this man with this malady that our text, most texts, uh, translate as dropsy. And they said, aha, here's our chance to trip him up because he broke one of our rules of who is righteous and who is not. They practiced judgmentalism against an innocent person in order to make themselves look better. And let me say this, obviously Jesus is innocent. He was perfect. He was the only person to ever live an entire life on this planet sinlessly. And yet they said they saw sin there. Obviously there was no sin there. Uh, even if you know someone in your community, in your home, uh, who would like to go to your church, and maybe they are practicing an obvious uh, public uh, societal sin. You still don't have to approach them immediately as though you are better than them because you don't sin and they do. Because listen, we're all sinful. It's just different types of sin. They need the love of Christ just as it's been shared with you. You need to share it with them as well. So uh, let's look at this poor guy a little bit, just a few minutes to understand what was going on in his life. Our text says he has dropsy. And when I first read that, when I first started to study this, I go, oh, finally, a, a, a malady in Scripture that Jesus healed that I can truly relate to. Dropsy. I'm dropping things all the time. But that's not what it means. If we look more deeply, if we look at this word, it's actually a medical condition that in today's language we call edema, which causes pain due to the swelling of the legs, feet and are visibly, very visibly around the eyes where the tissues fill with water because of kidney trouble, congestive heart failure, or liver disease. Now the Greek word being translated here is hydropikos. The hydro you might recognize even in English. We think of hydro and we think of water. We think of a, a hydroelectric dam. 
and what water can do in the force of water. In that original day, it meant a demon. It meant that somebody was suffering from something more serious on the inside that was obvious by something that was going on on the outside. Swelling of the feet, the legs, maybe around the eyes, because they had a more serious condition with their heart or their liver or their kidneys. Now, these judgmental men set a trap for Jesus. They must have thought that He really could heal him. So in some instances, they did believe that Jesus could heal, but they failed to connect it with the fact that He must be the Son of God. All they knew was is that He was more popular than them, and so they had to make Him look bad in order to make themselves look better. You see how it works. They manufactured their own standard of right and wrong that they could do that someone else might not be able to do or might not want to do, and then they could say, Aha, see, I'm better than you. You're breaking this list of rules. It might not necessarily be in God's Word, but I think it should be, and I, I'm better than you because I can maintain and keep that list. It's just ridiculous when you explain it that way to somebody, but oftentimes they'll still continue to live according to those presuppositions that they've manufactured over their lifetime. So they were judging Jesus, those prominent men, at that dinner were judging Jesus based on their own made-up rules that was not even in Scripture. They were condemning Him without due cause in order to make themselves look better than Him. And so, in meeting their challenge head-on, Jesus exposed their judgmental attitudes through the use of two questions. You probably caught them. First, he asked, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And second, he asked, if one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And in both verses 4 and 6, we see that these questions exposed their self-deluded sins of pride. In verse 4, it says that in answer to these questions, they had nothing to say. And in verse 6, that they remained silent. And why were they silent? Because they had no real defense for their actions. They had been caught in their own trap. They had been condemning the actions of others only to make themselves look better. It's kind of like a man who was driving to work one morning when he noticed that there was a car in the other lane that was swerving back and forth. And you've experienced this before. You begin to wonder if that person is ill or maybe intoxicated. And you say to yourself, how am I going to get around this person without them running into me? What is distracting them? Are they being careless? Are they putting my life at risk? And so the man accelerated a little bit, and as he's passing the car, he notices that there's a woman in the car, probably headed for work, and she's got her nose right up to the sun visor where there's a mirror, hardly even looking where she's going because she's busy while she's driving, putting on her mascara. And he thinks, that's not right. That's poor driving skills. That's putting my life in danger. And he gets so upset that her car starts to come over in his lane and he starts to swerve to get out of her way that he drops his cell phone right into his own cup of coffee that he's drinking with one hand and the cell phone in the other as he drives. He judges someone else for doing something else that's wrong when he himself is sinning as well. Or in this case, simply doing something that's careless. But anytime we put ourselves up on a higher plane than someone thinking that we're more holy than they, we are probably not looking hard enough at our own sinfulness. And friend, let me tell you, it's always there. It's always there. It might be a different type of sin, but it's always there. Jesus Christ has to work on us every day of our entire lives until we meet Him in glory to make us more and more like Him. And we never reach that point until heaven. We need to remember that as we relate to others and try to show them the love of Christ rather than judgmentalism. And then there's another way that people often try to make themselves look better at the expense of others. And it is by their arrogance. That's my second principle here today. Principle number two, we often ignore our own sinfulness when it comes to arrogance. 
So Jesus is trying to expose the sin of arrogance to these guys at this meal, when in verse 7, we see he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table. In order for you to understand really what's going on here, you sort of can figure it out. I mean, you've probably been at a family meal or maybe at a banquet or something, and uh, if there's a long uh, dinner table, who usually sits at the head of the table? A lot of times it's the, the grandfather or grandmother or oldest dignitary or most recognized dignitary, the president of the company, whoever it might be, sits at the head of the table. It's for thousands of years that's been the culture. And so was the case here. Now, in that day and age, uh, people didn't set at tables in chairs. They did have, uh, especially wealthy people, had nice tables, but the legs were only about this tall, about a foot. The table would be very close to the ground, and people would actually, I like this idea, I wish we would return to this. Uh, a lot of us do this, I guess, when we sit in the living room and eat with TV trays instead. They would get comfortable. They would lay down on the floor with their feet near the leading away from the table and they would usually recline on one elbow and then they would eat with the other hand and then people would proceed around the table and they would generally face all toward the person sitting at the head of the table and so uh, you might picture uh, a u-shape or, or, or a horseshoe design of people sitting around a table and the closer you were to the head of the table, the more distinguished you were. And so what would happen in a meal like this, especially this man was probably being a prominent Pharisee, was probably somewhat wealthy. What you would have then as you entered the home, the main court of his house that would be reserved on this day for this meal, this big almost banquet probably, is just you might have more than one table. You might have several tables. And so as the men and women would enter the room to eat, there would be a, a shuffle, if you will, practically a race. Sometimes it was well known ahead of time who would be sitting at the head of each table, and that was accepted. But then others would, if you will, imagine, recognize, it was almost comical. They would kind of push, shove, fight a little bit to get as close to the head of the table as possible. And so I think what we can imagine Jesus doing on this day, visualize it. He, he enters the room knowing ahead of time what's about to happen because he's seen this time and time again. Plus he's God. He's the son of God. He, he knows people's hearts. He sees what's coming. He enters the room and he just kind of stands back and he watches everybody fight for the most prominent places around those tables. Now they may have reserved a head seat for him? Probably not. Maybe they gave him a second or third row, if you will, from, from the prominent head of the table. Bottom line is, is they were all almost literally physically climbing over one another to get to those most prominent places at those tables because in their minds, that showed that they were better than other folk. And that was very important to them. They had established their own set of rules to make them look better than others and then they would impose those on people and call them sinners if they didn't follow the same set of rules and then jesus gives this parable i already read it once but let me reread it lest you forgot it he's saying it to these people in that room in response to what he just witnessed some of it sounds just a little practical but there's also some prophecy here he says if one of you has a uh, i'm sorry he says um when someone invites you, we're at verse 8, chapter 14, verse 8. He says, when someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give the man your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited... Take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I can relate to this. I saw something very similar to this many years ago. Uh, I was invited to kind of a banquet, a dinner, if you will. It was being hosted by my seminary to its alumni, and when I got there, 
uh, I saw my professor that I had had while I attended Dallas Seminary, and I already knew that he was the distinguished guest speaker. And we struck up a conversation before the meal. We were standing around a bunch of round tables. You've probably been to these, these dinners before. There's a bunch of round tables with chairs all the way around. Sometimes they even have name cards on the plates. There were no name cards on these plates, just obviously where you're supposed to sit at meal time. And we talked right up until someone said, please find your places, have a seat. It's time for us to serve the meal. We simply sat down at the two closest chairs to us at the time so we could continue our conversation. And as we were having the meal, I noticed out of the corner of my eye, the man who had coordinated that event was sitting there with his wife on one side and an empty seat on the other side, just glaring at me and fuming. And I realized, oh, he expected the uh, guest of honor to be sitting with him during that event. He would have looked a lot better. He would have had a place of prestige at that time. And I was in trouble because I had stolen his thunder. A lot of that was going on here. Jesus Christ was saying, what a petty, self-indulgent way of trying to make yourself look better than others. This meal is just one example of how people can treat one another in order to do that. And let me tell you, if you judge people on false pretenses, in other words, something that's not in God's word, they know it, they feel it, they recognize it, and they won't be so attracted to your message of faith through Christ is the only way to have eternal life. So Jesus said, this is a wedding feast. You guys, you Jewish men, you know what that means in a parable. I'm referring to that eventual meal that the Messiah will have with those who will be introduced, who will be allowed into His kingdom, and thereby be rejected if they do not put their faith in Him. So we finish up here today by reading three more verses, verses 12 to 14. He says, Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. You know, friend, there will be a time when Jesus' church will sit down with Him in heaven. And we'll all have one grand meal together. And we know that some of us will have more prominent places even than others. And we won't be there because that's what we sought. We'll be there because we didn't judge others based on our own set of rules and regulations. We only looked at God's Word. We knew that God loves sinners. We knew that Jesus Christ forgives them when they come to Him in faith because of the blood He shed on the cross. We should treat others in the same way, sacrificially loving them so that they'll know the love of Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.